We're so thankful that we have a beautiful crowd here this morning, many visitors with us. If you're visiting with us, we want you to know that you're a welcomed and honored guest. We pray that you open up your Bibles with us this morning. Let's go to Acts the 8th chapter. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8 will be there here in, in just a few moments. I want to begin with a verse this morning. I believe it's probably one of my favorite verses. I believe that if you were to go to the street corners and you were to ask people, what is your favorite verse in the Bible? I would imagine that the majority of people would say this verse. John chapter 3, starting in verse 16. And these are the words of Jesus. He said, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into this world to condemn the world, that the world through Him might be saved. You see, that's one of my most favorite verses in all the Bible because I think it's a beautiful verse that teaches a, a beautiful principle, and that is this, that God did everything in His power to ensure that you would not have to go to hell. That God did everything in His power to ensure that if you did go to hell one day, it would be over His Son's dead body. You know, sometimes we sing this song, look at His head, the crown of thorns that's placed on His head that was burled down into His brow. Look at His hands, the nail-scarred hands where the nails were driven into the wrists of Jesus as He was hung upon the cross. Look at His feet. Those nails that were driven into the ankles of Jesus on both sides of the cross so that he would be able to lift himself up and be able to breathe. But yet he died a, a death of slow suffocation. God did everything in his power to ensure that you would have the opportunity to go to heaven one day. I want you to do something for me this morning. If you're here this morning, you're not a New Testament Christian. I know that there are some individuals in our auditorium this morning that are not New Testament Christians. They've yet to obey the gospel. They've yet to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They've yet to repent of their sins, confess His name, be baptized, be buried with Christ in baptism for the remission of sins, to rise to walk in the newness of life. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. If you're here this morning, I would imagine that you probably know who you are. You probably know whether you've obeyed the gospel or whether you have not obeyed the gospel, whether you've become a Christian or whether you haven't become a Christian. But I want you to take a sheet of paper out for just a second, maybe write in the margins of your Bible. You don't even have to write it down. You can keep the reason in your head. But I want you to write down one reason, one reason to this question. What hinders me from being baptized. Write down the one reason that hinders you from being baptized. Now, I've been around long enough to know, and I've studied with enough people to know, there's always that one reason. There's always that one excuse that keeps others out of the waters of baptism. Maybe you're here this morning and you're writing down on your sheet of paper or in the margins of your Bible, or maybe you've got the reason up in your head and you say, well, I'll tell you what hinders me from being baptized. Somebody said something hurtful to me once. You wouldn't believe it, Zach. I walked into these doors one time, and somebody looked at me, and they said something to me that hurt my feelings. It was something that was mean. It was something that was demeaning. And I, honestly, from that moment on, I decided I'm never going to be a part of a church where there's people like that. I want to stand before you this morning and I want to sincerely say to you that if you have ever had someone say something mean to you, something demeaning to you, something that hurt you to the point where you decided, I'm not going to become a New Testament Christian, I'm going to apologize to you. I'm sorry that there was somebody who claimed to be a member of the Lord's church that decided to use their words to hurt rather than to help. I'm sorry that there was a member of the Lord's church that decided that that day they didn't want to be like Christ. They wanted to be a mean person. They wanted to be a hurtful person. I'm sorry about that. But you know, I'm before you this morning and I'm not pleading for you to follow after that person. No, I'm pleading for you to follow after a man who will never hurt you, a man who will never say anything mean to you, a man who will never demean you in any way. His name is Jesus Christ, and He is perfect. 
Well, maybe you're writing down on your sheet of paper in the margins of your Bible, or maybe you've got the reason in your head. Well, I'll tell you why I'm never going to be baptized. Hypocrites. Zach, don't you know there are hypocrites in the Lord's church? I'll tell you what, it doesn't take much time being a Christian to see that there are hypocrites in the Lord's church. And you're going to see right through them. You're going to see that they're not genuine. You're going to see that they're not authentic. You're going to see that they're not real. And I don't know what draws them to the life of a Christian, but it's sure not following after the example of Jesus Christ. There's going to be hypocrites. But you know, in all the years that I preached, and all the years that I've delivered the invitation, you know, never once have I ever asked anyone to be a hypocrite. The only thing that I've ever asked anyone to become is a New Testament Christian. The only thing that I've ever asked anyone to become is a real, authentic, day-to-day follower of Jesus Christ. Well, maybe you're here this morning and you're thinking, I'll tell you what hinders me from being baptized. I'd have to admit that I was wrong. I'd have to admit that things that I'd done up until this point in my life we're wrong. And I'll just be honest with you. I'm just not ready to admit that I'm wrong. Can I be honest with you here this morning? No one is right except God. I'm not standing up here on this pulpit that's two steps above you and I'm saying, you're wrong and I'm right and you need to listen to me. No, I'm not saying that at all because I'm going to be honest with you. A lot of times I'm wrong. Just ask my wife. I'm wrong a lot. But listen. I'm not asking you to follow after me. I'm not asking you to be right where I'm in right and wrong where I'm wrong. You see, I'm just asking you to follow after God because if it wasn't for God, we would all be wrong. If it wasn't for God, you know this, we would not even know that we need to be saved. We would not even know that we need to become a Christian. We would not even know that we have sin if it wasn't for God. So God's the only one that's right. And the only thing that I can do is align what I believe to what God has said in His Word. And if I'm saying what God has said, then that means that I'm right. If I'm not saying what God has said, if I'm not doing what God has said in His Word, then that means that I'm wrong. So, what hinders me from being baptized? I want you to take that reason, that excuse, I want you to tuck it down in your Bible. Maybe just keep it in your mind, put it in the back of your mind for just a second. We'll revisit it here for... For just a few moments. What hinders me from being baptized? You know, this isn't a new question by any means of the word. In fact, what if I were to tell you, this is a question that's 2,000 years old. This was a question that was asked by a man that we refer to as the Ethiopian eunuch. In Acts chapter 8. You know, there's not a single person in this auditorium here this morning that's not loved. There's not a single person in this auditorium this morning that's not valued. And there's not a single person in this auditorium this morning that we're not thankful for your presence. I want you to open up with me in Acts chapter 8. Let's read starting there in verse 34. Verse 34. So the eunuch answered Philip and he said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this or himself of some other man? And then Philip opened up his mouth. Beginning at that scripture, he preached Jesus to him. And they went away down the road. And they came to a body of water. And the eunuch said, what hinders me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all of your heart, you may. And the eunuch responded and confessed, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so he commanded the chariot to stand still. They both went down into the water. And Philip baptized The eunuch. Now, if I were to be honest with you this morning, there's probably some people in this auditorium that have a lot in common with this Ethiopian eunuch. For example, the Ethiopian eunuch was a very religious man. Here was a man who traveled thousands and thousands and thousands of miles to go to worship God in the manner which God had commanded him to worship. Now, I know that God has told us that where two or more gathered in our name, gathered in His name, there He is amongst us. But I want you to imagine for just a second that there's a command in the New Testament that requires us to go to a certain place, thousands of miles away, to go and worship God in an acceptable manner to Him. 
let me ask you this. How many of us would travel thousands and thousands of miles to go and worship God in the way that God had commanded us to worship Him? Well, I hope the answer would be all of us, but I think we could all say there would probably be a few of us that would stay behind and just say, you know what, this Christian life thing is just not for me. I'm not going to go thousands and thousands of miles away to worship God. This man was so dedicated to his commitment to God, he traveled thousands of miles to worship him. Here's another thing. You know, the Ethiopian eunuch did not know that he was in an unsafe condition. This eunuch thought that he was in a safe condition. But even though he did not know that he was in an unsafe condition, he was still willing to be taught about Jesus Christ. I can't tell you how many Bible studies that I've been in before where I've sat down and talked to the person and, and we talk about all these things. And maybe it takes a, a long period of time. We talk about belief. We talked about repentance. We talked about confession. The moment that we get to this topic of baptism, you know what happens to the conversation? It's done. It's over. Because they've already got in their minds what they believe about baptism. And it doesn't matter what you read them in the Scriptures. They're still going to say, well, I know that's what it says, but this is what I believe. Well, if you're not aligning what you believe with what God says, then what you believe is contrary to what God says. This eunuch thought he was saved. But then he heard the word and he realized he wasn't. And here's, here's the third thing. And this Ethiopian eunuch, immediately after he had Jesus preach to him, he requested and he received baptism. And doesn't that show you the urgency in being baptized? There was never a 24-hour period that passed in the New Testament where an individual who had heard the Word of God, who had believed, who had repented, who had confessed, was not baptized. It wasn't... Well, I believe today I'm going to be baptized two weeks from now. No, that's not what we read in the Bible. In fact, the Bible tells us on multiple different occasions. Think about the Philippian jailer. That very same hour, there's an urgency to, to baptism. But let me ask you this. Why did the eunuch want to be baptized? I want you to do me something. Do me a favor for just a second, and this is what I want you to do. I want you to read with me verse 26 all the way down through verse 35. You got it open in your Bibles? Verse 26, all the way down through verse 35. And we're not going to read all those verses, but what I want you to do is just do a quick reference search, if you will. I want you to look for one word. Here's the word, baptism. From verse 26 all the way through verse 35, I want you to look for one word. That word is baptism. Now, you're glancing, you're looking, you're searching. Let me ask you a question. How many times do you find the word baptism from verse 26 to verse 35? Here's the answer. Zero. You don't find it once in all the pages in those verses. So question. The Ethiopian eunuch is reading from an Old Testament passage. It doesn't say anything to do with baptism. So why did the Ethiopian eunuch, after we had Christ preach to him want to be baptized. Well, it's simple. Because preaching Christ meant preaching the necessity of baptism for salvation. Let me demonstrate what I'm talking about. You see, the eunuch and Philip are both on the other side of the Great Commission. Mark chapter 16, verse 16, right? Jesus said, He who believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He who believeth not shall be condemned. Also, we know that the apostles, those men who walk with Jesus on a daily basis, they preached and they taught the necessity of baptism for salvation. Acts 2 to verse 38. You know, there's not a single epistle in all of the New Testament from Matthew all the way through the book of Revelation that does not talk about baptism. In fact, I would dare say that every single one of the congregations that are written to in the New Testament, every single one of them was full of believing, baptized New Testament Christians. So why did the eunuch want to be baptized? Because he knew it was a necessity for salvation. Now, what hinders me from being Baptized. Now, as we look at Acts chapter 8, you're going to see there's three things, three scriptural reasons that will hinder one from being baptized. Here's the first one. 
believe. It's what we find here in Acts chapter 8. In verse 37, right, Philip says, well, if you believe with all of your heart, you may. To the question that the eunuch asked, see, here is water, what hinders me from being baptized? Well, we obviously know that one thing that hindered the eunuch from being baptized was belief. If you baptize someone who does not believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God or does not believe that baptism is essential, a necessity for their salvation, then you're baptizing them incorrectly. Belief is a part of baptism. Belief isn't pure mental assent. Belief is obedience. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I ask of you to do? You see, you must believe to be baptized. But here's another one. You must repent. Wasn't it Peter who said in Acts chapter 2 and in verse 38, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. He didn't say be baptized and then repent. No, he said repent and then be baptized. Same thing with Jesus. Jesus didn't say he who is baptized and believes shall be saved. No, he said he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. So there must be repentance as well for one to to be baptized. Go over a chapter to Acts chapter 3. Peter said, Repent so that your sins may be blotted out and seasons of refreshing may come your way. But here's the third reason. Water. Now we're talking about baptism in the truest sense of the Greek word, baptizo, and that is immersion. We're talking about an act where one is immersed, fully immersed in water, and rises to walk in the newness of life. They are buried with Christ in baptism, buried with Him in His death, to rise to walk in the newness of life. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. The eunuch knew there had to be water for him to be baptized. John chapter 3, verse 23. John and his disciples, now notice this verse, were baptizing people near the region of Anon. Why? Because, here it is, there was much water. We're talking about a baptism, not a pouring, not a sprinkling. We're talking about an immersion in water, where there is much water. So, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Now, I've given you a couple scriptural reasons as to what would hinder you from being baptized. But, you know, only two of those are are relevant here this morning in our auditorium. You know why? Because we've got this big, beautiful baptistry right behind me. The water's pretty warm this morning. So we've got plenty of water. The only thing that would hinder you from being baptized is belief and repentance. But here's the thing about belief and repentance. Those things can be fixed. One can come to belief. One can make the decision to repent. But what are some reasons that should not keep us from being baptized? Now, I'm just going to be honest with you. I would imagine that if I were to look at your sheet of paper, or if I were able to read your mind to the reason or the excuse that you wrote down as to what hinders you from being baptized, it probably would not be one of these two reasons. Because in my encounters, most people have the same reasons as to why they should not be baptized. And none of those reasons are reasons that should keep us from being baptized. If I were to look at your paper right now, and we were to ask the question, what should not hinder me from being baptized? Let me ask you something. Would I find the answer pride? Well, pride hinders me from being baptized. You see, some are too proud to admit that they're in need of the forgiveness of sins. And some are too proud to admit that they are in need of being baptized to receive the remission of sins. And some are too proud to admit that they have been wrong about baptism. And now that they've learned the truth, they say, well, you know, I'm still going to stick to my guns and I'm going to say that I was saved before I was baptized. But you know, if you were to take sticky notes, three of them, believe, baptize, save, and you were to go over to Mark chapter 16 and verse 16, and you were to read what Jesus said. Now put them in the right order in your mind. He who believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And that would be the right order. Now, let me ask you something. Is pride what's stopping you 
from becoming a New Testament Christian? I pray not. Let me ask you this. Think about this question. Was there ever a New Testament Christian within the pages of the New Testament that requested to be baptized? Was there ever a New Testament Christian in the pages of the New Testament that requested to be baptized? You know, as you look to the pages of the New Testament, you're going to see that oftentimes baptism is spoken of as a prerequisite going back to the Great Commission of baptism. So the answer to that question is... No, there was never a time in the New Testament where a New Testament Christian, somebody who had already been acknowledged as a believer in Jesus, somebody who had already been acknowledged as one who was washed in the blood of the Lamb, then requested to be baptized. Because baptism was an essential necessity for that person becoming a New Testament Christian. You see, pride should not, should not hinder you from being baptized. You know why? James 4 and verse 6. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. If you're here this morning and you're prideful, if you're proud, if you're letting your pride become stubbornness, God is already resisting you. To receive His grace, you've got to humble yourself because God gives grace to the humble. If I were to look at your sheet of paper, if I were able to read your mind, let me ask you this. What are the reasons as to why you do not want to become a New Testament Christian, to be baptized, would one of those reasons be your family? Well, you know, Zach, you don't understand. None of my family believes that baptism is essential for salvation. And therefore, if I go and I'm baptized then I'm going to have to answer a lot of questions and then I'm going to have to make some statements. I'm going to have to talk about it. And those family members, they're not going to be too happy with me because then I'm going to make them feel like a certain type of way. Well, some people are afraid to become New Testament Christians because they're afraid that their family might disown them or their family might distance themselves from. I've seen this happen before, haven't you? Have you ever seen somebody who's made the decision to become a New Testament Christian and their family doesn't agree with that decision and before you know it, their relationship becomes a little bit strained? Well, maybe you're here this morning and you're thinking, I don't want to become a New Testament Christian because my family's relationship is important to me. I love them, I value them, and you should. But it's going to put a strain on that relationship. Let me say something. When you become a New Testament Christian, you gain a new family. And that is the family of God. And I believe that that's why God designed it that way, because God didn't want us to be alone and isolated off to ourselves. God wanted us to have people to lean upon, people who supported us, people who had the same mind as us, who spoke the same things as us, who believed the same things as us. He wanted us to have a family. And 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15 says that the church is the family of God. When Matthew chapter 12, you remember this, when Jesus has somebody comes to him and says, listen, your, your mother and your family, they're outside, they want to talk to you. And Jesus says, who is my mother? Who is my brothers? And then he says this, notice this. He who does the will of the Father is my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters. So what do you got to do to enter into the family of God? It's simple. You got to do the will of the Father. Would it be better for you to obey God or to obey your family? It would be better for us to obey God. Well, maybe if I were to look at your sheet of paper and I were to see the reason that you wrote down, maybe the reason you wrote down was this, peer pressure. We know my friends at school, they're they're not exactly the most spiritually minded people. And if I were to become a Christian, I probably would lose them because they won't want to hang around me anymore. I'm living a new life. I'm I'm a new creation. And and they're just not going to want to be around that. Or maybe my coworkers. You know, I've been friends with them for 10, 15 years. We've got this whole thing, this whole relationship. We've got the same sense of humor. We've got all these inside jokes. And yeah, some of them are off color, but we've got inside jokes. And if I were to become a Christian, I've got to give up a lot of things. I've got to sacrifice a lot of things. They're going to be hard on me about it. 
You know, Jesus once taught us that peer pressure should never hinder us from professing God. You think about the Pharisees, and the Bible tells us in John chapter 12, verses 42 and 43, nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but, here it is, peer pressure, because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Isn't that a beautiful verse? The Bible says, They did not confess him. Why? Because they were afraid they were going to be put out of the social circles. They thought that they were going to be put out of the friend circles. They thought they were going to be on the outside looking in rather than the inside looking out. And they didn't want anything to do with that. So they they didn't confess Jesus even though they believed in him. Well, I hope here this morning we don't have anybody who's not become a New Testament Christian because... They're afraid to confess Jesus on a daily basis and live their lives as a follower of Christ. But what if I were to look at your sheet of paper and I were to see this reason? Or read your mind and see this reason? In proper understanding. That seems to be a common thing, and maybe you've encountered this before, where people believe that they have to have a a certain amount of knowledge about the Word of God in order to become a Christian. Well, If I don't understand, if I can't name every single book in chronological order from Genesis to Revelation, I'm not ready to become a Christian. If I can't name all 12 apostles in alphabetical order, I'm not ready to become a Christian. If I can't quote an entire chapter of Scripture, I'm not ready to become a Christian. Let me ask you this. Is that true when we compare what the people did in the New Testament to becoming New Testament Christians? I mean, if you were to take Acts chapter 2 and you were to look at this sermon that Peter preached, let me ask you this. What would those people on that day have known about Scripture? What people on that day would have known about the book of Galatians, the book of Ephesians? Philippians, Colossians? The answer is none of them because they hadn't been written yet. Well, what did they know? Well, they knew about Jesus being the Son of God. You have crucified Him whom God hath made, both Lord and Christ. They knew that they were guilty of crucifying Him. They knew about the ascension of Christ. They knew about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And then they asked the question, Verse 36, men and brethren, what shall we do? They knew they needed to repent, and they knew they needed to be baptized for what purpose? The remission of sins, and they knew that they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. As you look to the New Testament, you're going to see time and time again, 3,000 in Acts chapter 2, 5,000 over a couple of chapters more. Those people were baptized, and then they were taught about the things perhaps that they didn't know. They knew enough to become a Christian. You see, some people believe, I have an improper understanding about the Bible and therefore I'm not ready to become a Christian. You know what you need to know to become a Christian? Well, one, you need to know that you're a sinner. And number two, you need to know that God is the Father of Jesus Christ, that Jesus is the Son of God. And number three, you need to know that Jesus Christ died for your sins, that he shed his blood so that you might have the remission of sins, Matthew 26, verse 28. You need to know that Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, John chapter 14 and verse 15. And you need to know that one of his commandments is belief. Another one of his commandments is repentance. Another one of his commandments is confession. And another commandment is baptism. And therefore... You'll be taught how to live a faithful life unto Him. And don't let an improper understanding about what you need to know to become a Christian hinder you from becoming a Christian. Those are some things that should not hinder you from being baptized. But now let's revisit the first thing that we talked about. Now, sheet of paper. On it, a reason or excuse. The question being... What hinders me from being baptized? 
Only you know that reason, and only you know that excuse. This is what I want you to do. I want you to take that sheet of paper that you've written on. I want you to make sure that the capitalization is correct. I want you to make sure that the punctuation is correct. Proofread it a couple of times to make sure that it looks all nice and presentable. And then one day, when you are called up and you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and Jesus asks you the question, you heard the gospel. You became one who thought they were saved. Let me ask you this. What hindered you from being baptized? Why were you never baptized for the remission of sins? You could take that reason or that excuse and you could read it to me. Well, somebody said something hurtful to me once and I I didn't want to be baptized after that. Or, you know, there was a bunch of hypocrites and And really, it was just a turnoff to the church. And so I decided that I was never going to be baptized. Or it meant that I would have had to admit that I'm wrong. And therefore, I would have had to change. You know, every single person in this auditorium who ever became a New Testament Christian, you know what they had to do? They had to admit that they were wrong. Every single person in here has had to admit that they were wrong at one point or another. I have to admit that I'm wrong occasionally, because sometimes I fall for the wiles of Satan and sometimes I sin. But you'll take that reason or that excuse and I want you to give it to Jesus. I want you to hand it to him and you put it in his nail-scarred hands. And you remember what Jesus said in John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into this world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Or you got another option. You can take that sheet of paper or take that reason and here in a minute when we sing a song of invitation, you can bring it to us. You can redeem it, have it washed in the blood of the Lamb, get rid of that excuse, get rid of that reason, and finally make the decision to become a New Testament Christian. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Jesus said you had to in John 8 and verse 24. Unless you believe that I am He, you will surely die in your sins. Are you willing to repent? Peter said, repent and Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Are you willing to repent? That's a change in mind which results in a change in action. Are you willing to confess? The eunuch said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Are you willing to make the same confession? If you're willing to do those three things, if you have belief, if you're willing to repent, if you're willing to confess, then you're ready to be baptized. Why tarry is thou? Arise and be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So, don't leave this auditorium this morning uncertain of your spiritual destination. Make a decision today because God has done everything in His power to ensure that you can live with Him in eternity one day. And if you don't, it will be because something hindered Get rid of it.